idea of what you should do initially before starting asking questions. So packaging. The final goal when we design an ASIC is to test it, right? So the real question is, how are we going to test it? What is the best approach between wirebound or flipchip process to test the ASIC that you work monthly on? Are there path sites that must be respected and used for more specific finish or for the package process, for example? Or is it okay if I do blank? This is the magic question I heard a lot when you're designing an ASIC. And to say that it's a point of it is just to answer those questions. As you can see, it's basically you struggling with all those processes. So what is wire bonding? Wire bonding is basically connecting a wire between a chip and a substrate. So there are several ways to do wire bond. For example, there is ball bonding and wedge bonding, and also several material that can make them. So as you can see over here is all the mechanization possible in the past, which they made a connection, electrical connection with. And I, when I mean it's possible, today we're just going to talk about gold and aluminum wire bonding. But as you can see, there's might be a Russian somewhere who did with uranium, and I don't know why it's recessed over there. So what is the difference between ball bonding and wet bonding? Basically, the process itself, because on the left side, you could see is ball bonding. So we have a ball under the capillary of our tip that is connected with ultrasound and heat plus pressure. And then it's going, it's going to do a ball, do a loop, a second contact, and by the end, it's going to bond that contact with ultrasound and pressure plus heat, and then cut it off to make another ball with the E41. Compared to the wedge, the wedge is simply a capillary with a wire in it that is just going to use ultrasound and pressure on it to make the first bond. It's going to make the second loop, the loop, make the second bond, same thing as the first step, and then the wire is going to be cut and removed. So in the end, ball bonding looks like this. It's a sphere, a ball, compared to a wedge, which is more like a rectangle on the path. So mechanically, electrically, there's no difference between one and another. The real difference is between the material that is used, which is gold versus aluminum. So gold can be used for ball bonding and wedge bonding, but gold cannot be folded easily without the presence of heat, at least 100 degrees C. So if you don't have this temperature, this heat, just to be able to melt the gold, it's, I would say, nearly impossible. I've seen articles that people are demonstrating that it's possible, but they crank very high the ultrasonic power just to be sure that it's welding properly on the surface, which I won't recommend. And aluminum, well, it can only be used for wedge bonding, but aluminum can be weld at room temperature. So if you have a device that cannot sustain a high temperature over 100 degrees C, then aluminum wires are maybe your solution. So like, I, like I'm saying over here, we have a table right over here that shows the resistance compared for alu gold or aluminum, and also the burnout current that the wire can hold. So just to show, over here we have 20, five micron diameter wires and as you could see in the purplish what's it red rectangle gold is less resistive than aluminum and can sustain more current so depending on your device or project maybe it's not necessary to use gold wire bond if you don't have a lot of current that's going through it So which one is the best? Like I said, you, you need a large amount of power for your wires. Should your wire be as resistive as possible? Do you plan to, ass to assemble your ASIC on a PCB with a low temperature solder paste 
which is melting point is under uh, hundred degree, under hundred hundred thirty eight degrees, which is below the minimum heat that I mentioned earlier. Because if you're planning to do with different soldering process that cannot sustain that temperature, while well, it's going to melt again, and all your components can just go everywhere or have shorts. But you don't want this when you have work like three hours on it. So what do you need to know when you design an ASIC for wire bonding packages? Well, if you plan to assemble your ASIC on a PCB, your, your PCB must have at least this type of finish. Any for aluminum wires and any pig for cold wire bonding. The reason why is the nickel when it's passed over 100 degree on over 100 degree 120 degrees the nickel start to diffuse inside the gold and the nickel well it oxidizes and so there's more chance that the adhesion when i when we do a water bond at those temperature that is going to decrease it. so the palladium is making like a bridge, a wall, sorry, a wall in, instead of a bridge to block the diffusion of the nickel inside the gold. So that's why we highly recommend to use any pig instead of any for wire bonding with gold. Also, quick recommendation, your ASIC must have the finished pad of aluminum or gold because otherwise it won't be easy to wire model. Can you wait until... Okay, sorry. So what do you need to know when you're designing music also? Depending on the capillary that we use, we're not able to do very tight project, very fine pitch, depending also on the type of bonding process we use. For example, if we do bulk bonding, since it's only possible with gold, and it depends on the diameter of the wires and the capillary that we use, it's not possible, for example, to have with a 25 micron diameter wire, a pad that is less than 17 micron. Otherwise, we will end up with shorts or contact with another wire. And that's something we don't want when we do wire bonding. We want to connect it easily and pass to the next wire because we want to go faster. And as you can see over here also with the picture on the left, uh, right, sorry. The bond pad opening is how the pad should be open and the bond pad pitch is by center by center. So in the near future, if you need to have a packaging assembly or a wire bonding process that you ask for the tree IT, to the tree IT, um, these definitions are explained over here. So and also I repeated in the, the document, but just in case, so now you have a proper idea of what I'm talking about. So, the automatic wire bonder, since no one basically knows what this equipment do or needs to have to work properly on it, it's a programmable equipment, the workspace, so the area which we place the, the PCB, the substrate, the components, all that stuff, it's around 100. 80 by 248 millimeters. So it's quite a large surface. The heating plate, the heating plates can go to 200 degrees C. It can go to seven wires per second. So it's quite fast compared to the Samuel Paga for wire bonding. And also there's an adjustable table that can be lowered to 30, sorry, 50 millimeters. So it's not necessary to have components under your PCB because it's possible to not have it flat. 
but we will need to design a support that could hold your package or the PCB if not flat. So for example, over here, as you can see, this is a package called a CPG8, which have pins under it. So the stainless steel over here has a hole to just place the package on it. So it's completely flat on the equipment. So if it's not completely flat under your sample, well, we might need to develop some tooling and tooling takes time to design and to conceive because pandemic and all other stuff don't have that control. So, okay, that's enough talking about wire bonding. Let's go for flip chip. So, what is flip chip? Well, it says in the name. Basically, it's all your device are developed on a top side. So the back side is nothing. It's very simple. So we put some solder sphere or gold thumb bump on the pads on your ASIC. And then we flip it and we heat it to make them welding. So as you can see on the picture over here, for example, this is a soldering flip chip process. So we apply flux, then we take our chip with the solder ball, and then we put it on the, the PCB. We do a reflow, and then cleaning underfill, because underfill is quite necessary in those situations. It's just shrank the connection mechanically. And then PT. And then have good heat just to cure the underfill because at room temperature initially it's it's more liquid than solid and once it's heated it's cure and stay solid for I always said life. So pros and cons from flip chip process. Compared to wire bonding, the inductance the induct and resistance are quite lower in a flip chip and SMD than a wire bonding. Therefore, better performance for high frequency circuits. It takes much less space on a PCB since it's connected under the parts themselves. So you don't end up with more wire bonds that goes all around your chip, but it's literally under your chip. So if you're tight in, every, in your device, then it might be the right solution to use. The cons? Well, once it's break, once you have an issue with it, it's quite hard to repair it. You see, the bombs are under your chip. So you end up by breaking it and trying to clean what you have done. And I would say it's quite hard to work with something that you have flip chip, break it, and then try to clean all with this and the iron and removing all the tin. So you basically just waste a sample and a PCB with it. And also, well, the more tighter the pads, the more close the pitch is, well, the harder it is to find a PCB manufacturer that could end up with your specs. And if you find one, well, they're waiting for your wallet. So just to give a quick shout out uh, here at the Tracking Micro, we already did a lot of flip chip assembly with 300 micron diameter solder bump with a pitch of 200 micro. Barely any laptop project scanner, so it's nothing new for us. And also, we have the trace key and the pick and trace that could easily pick those components and do the flip chip assembly. So just pick, place on the substrate. And then we could put it in the oven or with a Tresky, for example, there's a hot plate. We could do the bonding straight up on the, the Tresky. It's a possibility. Oh, yeah. I think I've said a lot of stuff. So let me summarize, okay? So if you don't have like an aerospace requirement or you don't have high frequency signal, it's not even relevant to use flip chip bonding process. Just for your ASIC, just go with wire bonding. And as you develop the chip while you're test, as you develop your test chip, 
it would be more relevant to war bomb your chip maybe inside of a box, like a package of a DIP40 or DIP20 or a CPGA that could be easily swapped on your test bench PCB that is the big card with all the device, the FPGA and all the other stuff. So you could just easily pick your, pick your ASIC, replace it with another one. So it's basically just using a dollar board on the big test bench and could pass multiple device per day, I guess. I don't know your project, but this is just an example I'm giving to you. And so I would say while you're designing your PCB and your ASIC, I, the magic numbers you should always remember is basically the diameter of your pad is 70 micron and the pitch should be 76 micron. So this is the minimal after that. If you go higher, it's always fantastic. But in doubt, you can always ask me. So, any questions? Okay. Um, look. Okay, so <laughs> that's it, bitch. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with the people in the room with me, and then we will go with online and then flip back and so on. So now I, I show if there's anything. I mean, raise your hand. Okay. Small, since you can wait anymore. Yeah, uh, just a general comment. You didn't put any uh, numbers uh, number for your pages. In uh, one of the earlier slides, you mentioned the uh, Enig um, or Enig. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know what those are. <laughs> so those are PCB finish, or possibly under bump metallization that could be used on an ASIC also for any because an egg you can do a registration layer to RDL to just make a, an, a metallization that it's possible to do a solder bump on it because it's not mandatory to have this under bump metallization when we do gold wire bonding or aluminum wire bonding because gold can be bound on aluminum and aluminum can be, can be bound on itself. Um, in the flip chip process, uh -huh. how do you how do you align the the the, the two uh, receptacles? I should say, like uh, the, the ball, the the pads and the balls uh, on the okay. side. So, for the trust key, <laughs> there's a, a split beam. So basically, there's a like a double mirror in it which is split the light to see under your chip and on the substrate. So it's possible when you focus it properly to see under your chip and your PCB with the right focus. So for a trustee, this is the way to do it. With the pick and place, um, basically this war machine is pick, taking a picture under your chip and it's taking a picture on the PCB. And technically, if you Give him the right orientation, it should be done in the in the uh, last quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you did, did solder bumping before here with a uh, 100 micro diameter and 200 micro pitch. Mm -hmm. So, were the ball bumps touching each other? No. Oh. What was the distance? Uh, because it's 100 and 200, so aren't they touching? Uh, the pitch is center to center. Yeah. So there's a uh, hundred micron between each pads. Oh, uh, okay, 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 sorry. My mistake. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Good. Um, I will still go with the room. Should it Martel? Uh, yeah, if you can go back on the slide where you present uh, ball bonding and wet bonding, just say. Uh, 
Okay, hold on a minute. I'm just going to share my screen for everyone. Like this, everyone can see. Okay, which one? Yeah, third or something. Ball bonding versus wedge bonding. Yeah, this one. Yeah. This one, yeah. Um, Am I correct to say that when you do the ball bonding, it's basically a wedge bond on the PCP and the ball bond on the chip? Yep. Okay. So on the PCP, it's always a wedge bond. Exactly. Okay. It's possible to do the inverse, but in general, it should always be the first bond on the chip and the second bond on the substrate. So in our case right now is the ball bonding is on the chip and the wedge is on the PC. Because for example, if if we do like I would say silver, okay? Because it's possible to do gold on silver. Although we need to increase the heat to 250, which right now I can't with my table. Um it's less recommended to do the wedge on the silver because the silver will leave some material on the tip of the capillary. And since it's not really a wedge, it's making more, more like a crescent moon for gold bonding, then all the other parts that don't have gold just get dirt by the silver. And the more that we do after it, the more silver it accumulated on the capillary, and at some points, nearly impossible to do more wire bond. And so I have to change capillary and basically drop it in the instead of if it's just a bulb, which is covering all the uh, which is covered all the under the capillary, and I just press it quite more easier. My question? Um, you mentioned the to finish the ending and you think the ending was for aluminum only? And well, I've seen studies that they use ending with gold wire. And we could avoid the issue of the nickel that is diffusing too much in the gold by having more gold finish on the on instead. So instead of having like 15, yeah, 15 micron or so, you ask them to have like 200 micron. Yes, oh, sorry, 200 micron. Uh, it's more like 200 nanometers instead of 50 nanometers, sort of, okay? You could always ask the manufacturer to make the gold finish for water bonding. So, that way, the guy knows that he has to add more gold. So the nickel won't, but it will still, but the diffusion won't go in true enough while we do the wire bonding. And so the chance of succeeding will be more probable. Although I have some recipe that can do it on Enig, but I won't recommend it. My question was more about it. Is it the ending is not only for aluminum? Can it work? Can it work? Is it the same for anything? Like anything? Aluminum could be bond on any and anything. Okay. So There's no issue for it. It's mostly for gold bar bonding, which we highly recommend to use anything because of heating, nickel diffusion, and then it's diffused in the gold. So if you don't know if you will use aluminum or gold for bonding, better to be designed to see with any of the things. I would suggest this, yeah. Uh, second question. Uh, if we had a project saying we want to ball bond or flip chip on the northern ship, could this be possible? Okay, so first off, was the finish of the first PCB? What is the finish? Uh, sorry, the first chip is the finish. Second chip, what is the finish? First one, aluminum. Second one, 
Aluminum. Aluminum. I mean, it's made by TSMC, I guess. So, gold aluminum is it's doable. It's quite normal instead, for real. Um, so, what we will do is we will do the gold ball on your first chip, and then we'll do a thermal compression. So, it's a flip chip assembly process. But instead of using soldered bump, it's gold stud bump. So to do thermal compression, you take your chip, you flip it, press it on the other substrate, in your case, the other chip, which you align, quite important. And then with pressure and heat, there's some equipment with ultra sun, like, so you could have Pressure, heat, and ultrasound. So we could lower the heat to do the thermal compression. You will make a connection between your two chips. And then you will have to have a underfill, or I would say an epoxy just to shrink the connection between it. Because otherwise, if you drop it once, it might just go off. Yeah. But is the tree IT capable of such assemblies? Mm -hmm. I would say, well, it's all about technique. There's nothing concrete right now, but um, we will have to look for the pads, the size of both ship, and maybe there's always a solution to come up with. So, for example, your your second chip could be already in a wafer, and then once we just Assembly those easy quickly with the thermal compression might take up the time though, because the thermal compression can do only one chip at a time. And after that, the chip are placed, we could use the laser cutter, for example, or a dicer to just get through it, separate your assembly once it's done. Okay. There's always a way to figure an, an assembly process. Just you need to sit down and look with what we have. Good. Well, if I have another question. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, can I ask you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll flip with online question. I got it, we got. C'était trop bien expliqué, Gab, on n'a pas de question. Euh, J'entends pas. J'entends pas. Vas-y. J'ai dit qu'on n'avait pas de questions parce que c'était trop bien expliqué. Ouais, je suis pas en train d'écrire quelque chose, fait que j'ai peur. Je vais demander ce qu'il y a mon sac. T'es fucked. Ah oh, non. Dans le reste, on peut pas compter en plus qu'on écrit sa suite avec un gars de l'air chaud. So. <laughs> uh, good question, uh, Fred. So I didn't talk about protection for, for wire bonds. So what is possible to do is we call a glove top. So it's basically melting a resin on top of the device with the wire bond. Let me just try to find proper picture. So as you can see over here, the wire bonds are exposed to the air. So what could happen is basically someone doesn't notice that there's wire bond and just put his finger in it. And then you cry because it costs you a lot. Okay? So what it's possible to do is use a glove top or a cap, a seal, a lead, depending off what is it assembly in it. If it's an assemble inside of a dip 40, for example, it's possible to just use a lid and glue it over the device. So it's end up like all the chip you buy on DGT that it's easily solderable later on. Okay. A glove top is like I was trying to explain is a resist a resin an epoxy that is melting on it, place it, it's 
just embed your device. And after it, we cure it, and it became it solid. So it's after that, it's nearly impossible to rework the sample, but your sample will never be faced to someone breaking your wires, or you could drop it on the floor and the wires sh shouldn't go off. And we do that here in the 3ID. We have the, the epoxy to do some block that, that I test with the Frédéric Vachon a couple of times. Did you test dropping it? Uh, I did once. Or did you test putting your finger on it? I put my finger on it. Everyone put their finger on it. I mean, so, ah, oh, I don't see it properly. Although online, you should see perfectly. Um, so what you could see over here is the glove top in question that is covering all the wires. So the wires should not go up mechanically. They are to bump and they're going to be fixed for as long as we try our way to break it off. The UV curable uh, resin or? The one we have right here is both. It could be UV curable or heat curable. The recipe in question is you should do UV first, and then if there's some shadowing, you end up with the heat. When I'm quite lazy, I just use the heat, and it's giving the same result. So it's basically, I take all my sample, I drop it in the, the oven, and take it back an hour later. If you use aluminum wire bonds, the result will be the same. Okay. So in this image, the, the resin isn't actually covering the, the chip itself. It's, uh, it's just covering the wires and the part of on the chip, so it's like just the, on the first bump. Okay. Which this is what Kodeg Vachon tried to do to protect the wires for your project with the SPAD if I'm right. Because what I do in general is just cover everything with the epoxy. Although it could be a possibility to just cover the wires and try to protect all your device by adding a dam, so basically a wall to separate the fill, the laptop, from the device that we don't want to melt it. Uh, do you have any stimulation for the uh, side of the wire bar? Once again, I could show you the website with those numbers and put it uh, on Teams or under the under the email that you sent. But basically, I would say the intents can be calculated with like the formula about wires versus material and so it's. Mostly more resistance. Like what they are interesting people is more the, the resistance instead of the inductance of a wire. So. Speaking of the inductance, you said that um, flip chip versus wire bonding, better with flip chip on um, high frequency device. Can you define a little better high frequency? Is it uh, 100 megahertz, 1 gig, 10 gig. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for, for real. Okay. I mean, I think I've seen and then heard people use it. Was it you, one of your projects that you use like 100 gigahertz with wire bond? Never in gigahertz. Okay. You have it in that. 100 <laughs> megahertz. Like, I heard weird numbers with wire bond sometime, and I'm like, how is it even possible? And they're like, well, it's working. And I'm like, man. So for real, I don't know exactly about that. Since my part is more like packaging instead of trying to figure it out if it's the right potency. Uh, uh, sometimes in the high frequency, they use the wearable as the component of the safety. Okay. But in that sense, you cannot have a good in that sense on the chip. 
So in the right place, you can use the wild box of the top ten. Have you so I've seen uh, you mentioned a few packages uh, uh, names uh, in, in your uh, last slides. Uh -huh. Did you explore any packages that have a, a clear top on, on for them? It's, you know, for chips that are photo detectors. Um, no, exactly. I haven't looked different packages outside of what well, I would say those ones, but look different model that generally end up with the cover. Although all those are packaged are ceramic base. And my last read about high temperature environment, every environment and low temperature environment, my decision. Um, for low temperature, they highly recommend to use ceramic base substrate instead of laminate substrate for test. Not the chip itself, but more like when you package it, you have something with ceramic base. Yeah. But can Sense it, like the, the CTA, so quick fiction, thermal expansion, it's not the same and not reacting the same than your chip. But it's more cover about high temperature than low temperature. So for all the projects that you're developing with cryo and like normal gas at very low temperature, there's not a lot of stuff about water bonds, the reaction of water bonds at those temperature. But like they said, if you're using a wire which has the same metallization, sorry, a finish in a wire which is the same metal, so gold with gold finish or aluminum with an aluminum finish, then the reliability of the bomb should be more improved than using a combination. But there's always like aluminum on gold, it's always better than gold on aluminum and so on because heat and. and but, but you haven't checked any packages that have a clear top on gold, like a glass or um, a layer of transparent material. I mean, you can then open and cover up around with a glove top just to protect the wires, or you could buy a glass and cover yourself like a little window that you cover up under over your chip, and then we glue it, and it's still forever. Something to crack the window. But if yeah. Um... You, you, you talked about uh, assembling your PCB. Uh, I then remember, was it, is it better to assemble the components on the PCB before or after or along the chip? Depend on the matter. Okay. Um, Can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, I said depend on the material. I mean, from my point of view, if you do wire bond first with, sorry, what I'm saying. Always do the VSMT first, like the, the soldering and all that stuff with the big components first, and then wire bond after it. Because how are you going to do your serigraphy, apply all the solder paste if you have your chip with wire bond in your way? True. That, that's my answer, the final answer. It's basically you want flat surface when we do an, an SMT pro, assembly process to apply easily the solder paste. And then you pick and place component, you put it in the oven, and you end up with a fully assembled PCB. The tricky part now is, is it a high temperature solder paste or a low temperature solder paste? If it's a high one, we don't care. Since the melting point of the high one is 270 degrees C. So, and then the hot plate for the water bonding cannot achieve that temperature yet. Over time, okay. but, there you go. <laughs> but if you have done with a low temperature one, which is melting points at 138, now we have issue. Uh, is it possible uh, if you do the, just for example, my experience, uh, 
Is it possible that applying heat after the water bottling uh, it, it could have an effect on the durability of the water bottles? Or? Um, I've seen some studies that they're that they're looking about cycling. Mm -hmm. So they're doing like 300 for an hour and then do some measure and they're cycling those measure and seeing the improvement or I would say degradation of it. Um, it should, I would say it should stick, still stick, it should still be connected mm -hmm. if the, the process of the wire bombing is done properly. And, then, and now you look at me like, how do you know if it's a problem? There's a norm that is explaining and giving a way to figure it out, which is called doing a pull test and shear test. And if these results are higher than, well, I would say 2.5 gram force for now, because I don't know which material we're talking, but or the brick load of the wires with it literally right on the box with the wires, then everything will be fine. Even though if you're doing a lot of cycling, I think there will be a little bit of degradation since with over with time and a lot of cycling you might end up with it, but maybe not too much. Depend on even with high heat like if you're doing through hole connection. Nah, it should not it should not go up with the okay. if you're doing like through hole connection. I, unless you're telling me that your wire bond you're using an iron at like the 700 degrees C or something, which I think the iron will start to break. Uh, about the new uh, advanced in uh, packaging uh, methods, well, three I can so I can have those like you know the sleep on the hunger I don't know things like that. Um, okay, so silicon interposer, I would say right now, there is a project that is developing the conception of silicon interposer. I cannot say more since I might put my foot somewhere where I should not, but there, there's a project starting about making silicon wave, silicon interposer. And developing. What do you mean by making it? Um, I mean, the silicon interposer is like an old technology that you use as a PC, like that. You, you use the uh, like the. Yeah, instead of a PCB substrate, you use a silicon. You use that technology, like the. Uh, I would say yes, but well, I cannot go even further since right now there's a project that is ongoing about it. And I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it more than there's a project going on. If you're talking about the Kevin's project, that's not that much confidential. It's not even about Kevin's project, it's something else. Okay, because in the group with the GF and John Hustle, we're working on silicon interposer, but for large scale experiments. So the goal is to have a lot of photo detectors. And since the detectors are in silicon, then would like to have instead of a PCB, a silicon substrate place the devices. Since the CP will match between the electronics and the interposer, uh, that's the best solution for us. And uh, we're not building this interposer here at 3IT, it's a German company uh, that is developing it for us. And um, what is the name of the, this uh, ICM? And uh, what, what we are designing is some kind of a design kit like uh, you would use for any CMOS and cabinet cabins. So uh, the purpose is to have uh, four layer on top, four layer at the bottom with uh, vias, true silicon vias to connect them. And uh, well, right now it's still in development and it's so expensive, but uh, maybe in the 
near future it could be interesting for packaging devices or to do a fan out between a small bit chasing and then something larger on the PC. Yeah, that, that, uh, that explains everything. Yeah. It's replacing PCB by silicon. Yeah, but most of the time, what they are trying to do in the industry is to replace a large PCB with the packaging and all that stuff to smaller component. Then you don't have to put the package. You can just place the pair die directly on the silicon mm -hmm. small interposer. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything is smaller. So even if you're using a, a CMOS technology to do your interposer with a high need parasitic, then the performances are better than a large PCB with packaging and all that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The size of the tracing is smaller than the multiple volume. But for what does the size of the trace trace between two packages will be smaller? Yeah, right. I have a question uh, regarding the pressure, the pressure applied where you do the war bonding. Uh -huh. um, if you compare gold and aluminum and uh, wedge and ball locking, is it always the same pressure or which technology uses less pressure to do the bond on the ASIC side? Let's say my device is really uh, for travel, and I don't want to have to lie too much pressure on top of it. So, what would you recommend? And if you don't know, I would like you to do it for me, please. Um, on top of my head, okay, first off, the, the good answer is I will have to look. Now, to start up, Small conversation about it. Um, on top of my head, since it's not just pressure, it's depending on ball or wedge, but it's pressure and ultrasound. And with ball bonding, it's pressure, ultrasound, and heat. Depend of is your device chip, your implemented developing, it's like to be heated or stuff. And like how is going to react at those temperature? Because if at those temperature is becoming more fragile, then oh, let's already forget about bulk bonding. I'm not concerned about the temperature since uh, this fragile device might already be done at higher temperature than uh, 150. Okay, so no temperature issue. So now it's really the pressure. Okay. Since it's literally like centinewton, the pressure applied on it, so it's basically like one one centinewton is close to one gram force, and I think some of my recipes don't even pass twenty gram force to just do the bomb on the of the bomb. So if if your device cannot handle like twenty gram of force, I mean. Well, my question came from uh, when you do is design, most of the time there's fabs library that are made for wire bonding and there's fab that are made for flip chip. Mm -hmm. Most of the time the wire bonding fabs they're using the full stack of the metal, so at all top and all with the eyes to make sure that even with the pressure of the wire bond, the, the pad will remain like, solid, but with the chip, most of the time you can just use top metal. So I was wondering. Uh, what kind of pressure is applied with the work on the machine? Well, it's quite this. Okay, doing a, a wire bonding, like just make a bond, a weld of a bond, it's destructive in itself. I mean, you, there's pressure, the ultrasound, and what I mean by that is if you have, if you apply too much pressure, too much ultrasound, you're doing cratering. So it's basically just you're digging in your device, and if it didn't stick, well, it looked like a crater in your on the device. So why is there a difference between a bomb, a pad for a chip, and then a pad for 
for bundling, well, for flip chip with solder bund, since it's just you make a bond which is done with SAC 305, so high temperature temp, solder paste. Well, when it's going to do the reflow, it's just going to melt and cover up the path. So it need, and also the process to fabricate a solder bond doesn't need to apply any pressure on it. It's just, it's literally, you deposit the metal, or you could use like a squeegee just to wrap up the metal, the, the solder paste on top of the path, compared to the other one, which I said is destructive in its own way. Because if you apply too much ultrasound, too much pressure, then all of the power of the ultrasound can, is diffusing in your chip, and it goes even further if you're not careful with it. So if you're using flip chip with the double bond beam, you would suggest to use... Yeah, I would suggest to use wire bond pad. Because, like I said earlier, you need at least to apply the gold stud bond first. So to apply gold stud bond, it's basically do the first weld, then you end up with a wire bond process, which is what well, it's not completely done, but part of it. And then for the flip chip with gold bond, you have to still apply pressure on the with the thermal compression. Yeah, you need to apply pressure and you need to apply heat. And sometimes some equipment have ultrasound equipped with it, so we could lower the heat and maybe lower the pressure. I didn't explore this solution. So here at Triad, the gold bond thing is not. Well, it's not a recipe that you use frequently and it's all tuned and ready to use. There's some development to do on it. Yeah, there's development doing it on it to do to do stud bump, like yeah, sorry, yeah, gold stud bump. Like my you no know, Kevin already tried a couple of times on his wafer. Um I'm working on my side also to do some on some Zazig. Well, I had to figure out how to stick it on my table, but that's an issue that I'm solving it uh, and after it it's thermal compression which is control it's been done by Malak a couple of times and I know how to do it so if I have a project with a large using with a lot of bios and I want to flip chip it well that depends how many bars you're applying because the thumb rule is basically 1.5 to a uh, half a newton, half a newton, 1.5 newton per stud bump. And our harm can go like 1,000 newton. So I would say if you go like over 500 IO, call C2MI, they might have one, which is, I I've seen it, it's literally like an hydraulic press for real. It's, Big the equipment they have to do, big solar set, big thermal compression chip. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, one, uh, Last question. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for flip chip, uh, mm -hmm. I think the problem is you have the pressure all over the chip. But for wire bond, it's not like that. Depend, so. depend the flip chip process you're using. If you do a flip chip process with solder bump, there is no pressure applied on the chip yeah. at all. So about running to the wire bump, you only have the pressure on the edge. Uh, the pressure will be only on the pads, which in general are on the pad ring, which is on the edge of the chip. Yeah. But like I said earlier, it's around 20 gram force. A silicon wafer that is a 300 micron thick clearly can handle it. But from a uh, circuit design the point of view, uh, it's uh, for bullet chip, might be the first of all of the chip that kind of uh, affect the asymmetric or something on the chip. But for what wire mount is not like that, it's only on the edges. Well, for a flip chip process, you could just 
to the pads all around your device. And you know, it just needs to be even. Like if you're applying like on the corner some bump, then you should have bumps on all your corner. If you're applying bumps in the center of your chip, then it's fine because it's quite hard to, act, to be symmetric. But if you're starting to apply in each quadrant, then you need to be symmetric just to be sure that everything will be even all around your sample. Otherwise, when you're going to do the reflow or the, well, for reflow, so solder bump, you might end up with the chip that is going to move around, shift easily on a direction because there is more metal that is reflowing at that moment. So there's more activity on the cycle. So it's like more like a metallization and a, a reaction in the oven than a, a designing. Well, it's and it's coming. It become a design problem, but it's something you need to fix because of a reaction that is doing in the oven. So you need to for, so for so third bump, you need to be even all around to have. A mirror on all sides to be basically cover up the sample with solder bump. You cannot just do a corner and then call it a day. Although with gold stud bump, you have a little bit more freedom. Yes, you have to do around your sample, but it's possible to have, and you have, you need to have like a proper pitch and a little bit of symmetry. But in the center inside of the package is more forgivable. Since the process for thermal compression compared to a reflow oven is just it's already holding the component, it's applying pressure and heat, and it's trying to stick it in that position. And as long as it's not done, the head that holds your chip is not supposed to go off. So it's more forgivable than the solder pump, but it comes with developing and like a we said, you need to have the wirebound pads instead of flip chip wirebound for gold stuff pumping and so on. Okay, so that was the last question. Um, like I said. Okay, so if you have any question, I mean, just ask me. I will reply with pleasure. Good night. Good night.